This is an audio visual podcast on replacing the Resource Management Act, take two, enter the Natural and Built Environments Act and the Spatial Strategic Planning Act, sorry, not Spatial Planning Act, brought to you by Ben Ross. Remember, transport begets land use, land use begets transport, and both beget the user environment in a city. As we will see today with the strategic, at least the Strategic Planning Act, we will see how the two are going to be finally married together when it becomes do when it comes to doing planning across New Zealand, not just in Auckland. Again, just about a bit about me. I am a spatial planner and an urban geographer who's been at the forefront of advocacy and in, in improving the human experience here. In Auckland and Southern Auckland, I am a spatial planner and urban geographer by nature and qualification, and have done advocacy work on large projects such as El Monaco and Airport to Botany Rapid Transit, to smaller pace making projects such as street coming, park clips, and bus lanes. I pride myself on building relationships with the decision and policy makers and fellow urbanists and those who are wanting the urban area to be one of a human experience not a human drama. Context. So recently I had done a podcast on replacing the management act, Resource Management Act with a Urban Environment and Building Act. Since then, two major policy instruments have come out. One is a policy instrument going live, and one is a report that will go to government after the election. And if the recommendations are adopted as a whole by the new government after the September elections, it will become law by the end of next year. So the first thing that came out recently with little fanfare was the National Policy Statement on Urban Development, which is basically using the MPS of the Resource Management Act to direct councils, including Auckland, to do more or give them the tools to do more urban intensification. And the main two that were done was removing parking minimums from residential and commercial. Now in Auckland, it's already removed from residential, but it removes it from commercial. And this applies, especially with our metropolitan centers where we try and encourage mixed use and minimum parking requirements made it too expensive. While within what they call an acceptable walking distance, and it's been debated whether it's 400, 800 metres or 1.5 kilometres, or all of the above, from a planned or current rapid transit corridor and also frequent trans transit network corridor, so that's a bus, or a bus running at least every 15 minutes, that a minimum of six-storey development, so either residential, commercial, or mixed use, is enabled. It's not a maximum, it's a minimum. So places like Dominion Road, Tiarangi Drive, or if they don't have urban zoning that allow of at least six storeys as a minimum, the unitary plan will need to be updated to reflect that. And that goes live from August. A report had come out on Wednesday, the 29th of July. So yesterday, by the time I did this, I was writing this podcast, on replacing the Resource Management Act. Basically, the RMA is too far broken and it needs to be replaced. And three sets of legislation, legislation proposals were proposed. I'm only going to cover two because they have pretty much near universal support. The third one is going to be extremely contentious, and that's around climate change adaptation strategic retreat, which you'll find will become prevalent in coastal areas with sea level rise. But the other two was a natural a natural and built environments act or an MBEA, and the strategic planning act, which covers spatial planning. Both would replace the RMA, and the podcast will be looking more at the Strategic Planning Act, with a separate podcast being done on the Natural and Built Environments Act. These laws will go before the House after the election and should be in force by 2020, end of 2021, with a 10-year implement, 
implementation date given. District plans typically last 10 years before review, although the Auckland Spatial Plan and the Auckland Unitary Plan are 30-year documents updated every 6 to 10 years. There is a large play, the report had a large play on integrated planning or spatial planning, which would become finally statutory weighted. If you saw my last podcast, you would see that the Auckland plan is not currently statutory weighted, and I had called on it to be statutory weighted, which means all other plans must give effect to it. It looks like if the Strategic Planning Act were to become law, spatial plans would be statutory weighted, and all other plans must give weight to it. The link is there on how to access the report. Quickly again, so we'll just do a brief recap. So our planning system is in the complete muddled. It's muddled across different silo legislations, which allow for no crossover. This allows for inefficient planning and spatial forms. And as some will say, this also means in we're insecure in our infrastructure provision, hence why we have a 50-year deficit, which will cost us at least $100 billion to fix, let alone whatever construction capacity we have in the post-COVID world. As you can see here, you've got the two local government acts, because one also impacts Auckland, the Resource Management Act itself, the Land Transport Management Act, which actually gets addressed in this new proposed legislation, the Building Act, which is a bit silent at the moment on how that's getting done with, and urban design, which has been partially codified in the National Policy Statement Urban Design, uh, Urban Development, but will be more strengthened in the Nash, uh, Natural and Built Environments Act and possibly in the Strate Strategic Planning Act if spatial plans drop down to sub-regional or site-specific level. Does this all sound familiar? Yes, it does, because I have podcasted on this before. You can find them at http colon slash slash v-o-a-k-l dot net where the podcasts are all sitting there post-COVID. What I had proposed, so I had not seen the report before I had written the first version of this podcast. I had no, I had an inkling it was coming out, but I had no inclination of what it was going to propose. So whatever may be seen, is pure coincidental if such a thing exists. But what I had proposed under my Urban Environment and Building Act, so natural environment was to be handled separately, was that spatial planning was to sit at the top of the chain, of the hierarchy, and it was to be statutory weighted. You come down and then infrastructure for financing comes in on the side because the spatial plans will tell you what the behaviours of the urban area are, what the behaviours will be in influencing the spatial form of the urban area, and vice versa going back the other way. Thus, because we have the two patterns in place and the two and the instruments on how we can influence this either way, you can now do your infrastructure provisions, hence you can do infrastructure financing. So with infrastructure financing now available, it comes in and then you set about doing your unitary plan, which is your district and regional plans combined, your long-term plans, so that's your 10-year budgets that councils must produce, and then the building code, which is the building act. So they all get mushed together. And then you've got down here the unitary plan and the building code would allow urban design to take effect. But the point being, under what I had proposed before this report had come out, is that urban design, unitary plan, long-term plans, the building code, and infrastructure financing must all give effect to the spatial plan. And the spatial plan is a 30-year document reviewed every 10 years. Again, spatial planning, very briefly. Spatial planning is when we refer to the methods and, approach and approaches used by the public and private sector to influence the distribution of people and activities at various scales. The term spatial would be used primarily to refer the way planning should deal with more than just simple zoning, unitary plan, land use planning, unitary plan, or design and physical forms of the cities and regions, unitary plan, partially the Auckland plan, urban design. 
but it also should address the more complex issues of the spatial relationships of activities such as employment, home and leisure uses. So you're looking at the social side of the leisure, the Auckland plan. So spatial planning combines the Auckland plan, which was the social side, and the unitary plan, which was the physical side. You're bringing the two together and it becomes spatial planning or urban geography. So this is what I do as a spatial planner. And it should be noted for the institutions that as a spatial planner, I can go, I can do spatial planning exercises from national to interregional. So say the Golden Triangle of Auckland, Waikato, the Bay of Plenty, down to regional, Auckland itself, sub-regional, which is South Auckland, community, Monaco City Centre, site-specific, any lot that comes up say you wanted to redo the entire Monaco Mall, spatial planning would kick in to see how to best do land or make the most optimum use of your land that reflects the uh, relationship of employment, homes and leisure uses. Leisure uses um, also time with civic infrastructure and hospitality. The RMA replacement. So this is now kicking into the resource management Act replacement, take two, enter the Natural and Building Environments Act and the Strategic Planning Act. So yesterday, the, an independent report came out saying basically the RMA is in a mess, absolute, complete and utter mess. And that's given because the RMA never had the spatial form or the human geography side of the ledger ever in, uh, of the coin and ledger ever included it only did the physical side and as you remember spatial planning spatial relationships of activities such as employment homes and leisure uses this is the human side of the ledger so the RMA never accommodated the second the primary half of what I did compared to overseas so as a result this group recommended repealing the RMA in its entirety and it would be replaced by as I said, I'm only looking at the NBEA and the SPA. I'm not looking at the climate change stuff yet because that will change. And then I need to see what government and the other parties' inclinations are, so basically the parliament's inclinations are. But the RMA would be replaced by the Natural and Built Environments Act. And you would also have the Strategic Planning Act. And I'll be focusing quite a bit on the SPA because this is where spatial planning sits given that I am a spatial planner. The aim of the review was integration. You would have noticed earlier I said the Resource Management Act looked at the physical geography side of the ledger but never looked on the human side of the ledger. Yet you go back to spatial planning which is what I do as well as urban geography and the spatial planning is not only looking at the zoning, unitary plan, land use planning, unitary plan, the design and physical forms of cities and regions, unitary plan, and also urban design and the building code, but also the issues of spatial relationships, so the human side of the ledger, such as employment, homes, and leisure uses. Auckland plan, not statutory weighted. So the review was looking at integration. And not only would the NBEA and the SPA have to relate to each other, and more to the point, the NBEA has to give physical weighting to the SPA, and you'll see how later on, but the other silos, the Local Government Act, and then the Local Government Act Auckland Amendments 2009, the Land Transport Management Act, Transport, so that will hand, that handles your regional land, land transport plans and regional public transport plans. Side note, if the SPA and NB, NBEAs go through under the SPA situation, the uh, RLTPs and RPTPs would be taken off Auckland Transport and they would go back to Auckland Council. So Auckland Council does all planning and Auckland Transport just becomes the service delivery arm. So that's what would happen there in this integration pattern. But these two new pieces of legislation would integrate the LGA, the LTMA, and the third piece of legislation, the Climate Adaptation Strategic 
retreat would also have to incorporate the climate climate change response act and the spatial planning spas would have to incorporate this as well so it's all a little bit complex at the moment because the silos have been so separated for so long and trying to bring them together is going to be an extremely interesting exercise but the purpose of this review is looking to integrate this all up together and to break down the silos which have plagued us for so long the natural and built environments act or the nbea would be so the purpose of this act if it was to become law would be to achieve positive outcomes to support the well-being of past and present generations so as a physical and social side but it's still more focusing on the physical because we're still looking at our physical geography natural resources so that's the natural side of the ledger coming in so there's your physical geography now we're coming slightly into our urban geography so we're coming into spatial form somewhat but we're not touching human geography just yet i'll show you where human geography sh shoots in in a minute so we're looking at targets and limits of our boat natural and built environment. so you're looking at the physical capacities the nbea will look at the physical this is the physical capacities note when i use the word physical human urban spatial we're looking at the limits of the physical limits of the natural environment and the built environment which is the city thus the process stronger processes and recommend and national directions will be needed and can be introduced to allow the introductions of combined plans and this will become more uh, clear when we i cover the spa the strategic planning act for each reason for each region so we're going down from 100 plans down to 14 14 plans across 14 regions auckland is a region on its own and it is expected that these changes result in clear direction and reduce complexity on enhancing environmental quality now this is uh, environmental usually means physical and in geography terms because uh, because i'm also a geographer if i was to take my supra qualification in trade it will usually typically mean physical although human can be included you need to usually reference human specifically so this is looking at the natural and built environments so the, the natural environment and our city environments at a physical level we're still looking at it at a physical level so your combined plans or integrated plans in this side would still be your unitary plans your land use plans what we can do with our land within reason set out by the strategic planning act or a spatial plan so this is where your unitary plan would sit is in here and by definition Auckland already does one the rest of the regions will be required to develop their own unitary plans and all and if the MPS UD was anything to go by and standardization of language was to occur it will be following the Auckland standardization program the strategic planning act or the SPA this is this has my attention the most being a spatial planner the proposed strategic planning act or the spa would set long-term strategic goals 30 years although with climate change it goes out to 100 so this is a big long one to facilitate the integration and legislative functions across the resource management system now just to throw in another geography term we're coming into environment geography environmental geography which covers resource management the spa when it is in force and we're setting out spatial planning which is in bold and i'll get to in just a second will, inc will include the functions exercised under the nbea the local government act the land transport management act so this is where um our out this is where the regional land transport plans are taken off auckland transport and handed to auckland council 
and the Climate Change Response Act, although there's another act floating around that deals with adaptation strategic retreat, and might, it will be uh, include the functions of these acts already in place. So it will include the functions, meaning the SPCA becomes the super, if I'm interpreting this correctly, this will become the supra legislation that sits over the top. What does that mean? This legislation is designed to integrate land use planning with the provision of infrastructure and associated funding and investment. Remember this? The spatial plan would be written, the infrastructure financing kicks in to reflect this, and the infrastructure financing would enable the unitary plan and the long-term plans and allow the building code and the urban design to be realized. So you're br bringing together transport, uh, infrastructure and land use together for the very first time, which is what spatial planning does. Remember, transport begets land use. Land use begets transport and both beget the user environment of the city. Thus, regional spatial planning, so spatial planning at a regional level, so Auckland is a region, the Waikato is another, the Bay of Plenty is another, will play a critical part in delivering these intended outcomes for the resource management system. The spatial plans must reflect 30 years of growth, 30 years of intended spatial form, residential, commercial, industrial, civic, green space, infrastructure, which is physical, civic, transport, again green, and if you bring in the human side of the ledger, social. The new legislation would include strategic planning, spatial planning for the urban growth and responding to the change and measures responding to the effects of climate change and the identification of areas unsuitable development due to their natural values or importance to Māori. Those, that's a big, those are the big two. Unsuitable development due to natural values or importance to Māori. This has never been, it is currently reflected in the Auckland and Unitary Plans partially, but this will be codified even harder. So your spatial plans must reflect this. Your infrastructure financing and your NBEA with its Unitary Plans will then execute it or implement it. So the SPA, as has been interpreted, sits at the top. The key emphasis sits on spatial plan again sits on spatial plan you're going to hear this term a lot from me over the next 18 months and you're going to hear the term come out a lot more as the spa and nbaa get written up and codified into law through the parliament but the key emphasis sits in this regional spatial planning will play a critical part in delivering intended outcomes for the resource management system what Auckland has, resource-wise, physical resource-wise, so the natural carrying capacity of the land, the sea, the water, and the air, and the human capacity, i.e. population and infrastructure and housing and jobs to match it, will come into critical part when developing spatial plan for which all other plans must give effect to basically if the or if the nbea your unitary plans your long-term plans and your infrastructure financing are not giving weight to your spatial plans as dictated by the spa this isn't going to happen as currently happening and this is why we have environmental degradation and i'm referring to the geography version which is physical air, soil, water, and human, health, mental health, social deprivation, negative economic productivity. Spatial planning is going to become extremely critical in delivering the intended outcomes for handling these resources and capacities. So 
statutory weighting. You might be asking uh, uh, under the SPA, are we going to have statutory weighting for things like the Auckland plan? My interpretation of it looking at this is yes, under managing urban growth, which has never been handled under the RMA. Is it's like, and it even the review pointed it out, is it's lack of provision. And it's become a pet peeve of mine for the last 10 years, especially when the council planners set our growth projections to medium, but even our elected representatives know, and as I know, it is high, if not ultra. And that includes post-COVID. But as the report points out, it has become extremely apparent in our larger urban areas, Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, and even Queenstown for that matter, we are substantial increases. So this is not medium growth planet, Auckland Council planners, Auckland Transport, Water Care. This is substantial, which means high or ultra in growth. But we've got insufficient capacity to facilitate this. Your spatial plans will reflect this. Hence, will they become spatially, uh, sorry, not spatially weighted, well, they are spatially weighted, statutory weighted, and i.e. everything else must give effect to the spatial plan through the SPA. The answer is, as I see it, yes. These outcomes would be supported by the use of national policy statements that are currently in use, so the NPS UD would still be in effect if it doesn't get codified into the SPA as it is. But it's also pointing out that, but as I said, it's, it's pointing out that these economic, these outcomes would be supported by the use of national policy statements such as those currently used, the NPS UD, the National Policy Statement Urban Development, which is currently goes live in August, the great use of economic instruments, and importantly, by the Strategic Planning Act we propose thus far. Again, there it is, the SPA. We expect spatial strategies. So these are spatial strategies, just another name for a spatial plan. So they expect spatial strategy will be prepared on a regional basis under the SPA, which will identify areas suitable for urban growth as well as areas not suitable. We've got quite a bit of land down here in South Auckland currently not suitable because it's floodplain. And would also facilitate the provision of infrastructure. Once you know where you can do growth, once you know where the population is going, once you know where your job centres are going, you can follow it up with infrastructure provision, physical, water, energy, transport, road, rail, bus, and active modes, civic, schools, police, fire, hospitals, and technically parks green, it's, which is technically informal open space, urban forests, regional parks, to support this growth. And it is saying this, and the reason why this would be the SPA and the special strategies of spatial plans would become statutory weighted, is it is an effective way to achieve this integration, so that would be across the NBEA, the unitary plans, the re uh, regional land transport plans, the regional public transport plans, the long-term plans, it would be an effective way to have this integration which has been missing in resource management to date. The NBEA, furthermore, would improve certainty around the resource management. So the SPA, the spatial planning is quite high level. The NBEA comes down a notch or two. The NBEA would improve the certainty of that resource management center by re requiring the resolution of any potential conflicts between any identified outcomes th through national direction by the Minister of the Environment or in the combined plans we propose at local government. You, you know. So the plans are going to have to reflect the conflicts and how it's going to be resolved. Key recommendations, and this is on the strategic planning side. I will cover the MBEA and the Climate Adaptation Strategic Retreat at later dates once I know a little bit more about them. But the key recommendations under the SPA 
and spatial strategic integration and spatial planning. There's that. There's the phrase again. Spatial planning. As I said, you're going to hear a lot more of this over the next 18 months. There should be the SPA to promote the social, economic, environmental, and cultural well-being. Oh, social, economic, environmental, culture, well-being. Where does that sound familiar? Apart from that graph says, oh, hello. The term spatial was used to, to primarily refer to the way that planning should deal with more than simply zoning and land use planning or the design and physical forms of the cities and regions, but also address the more complex issues of spatial relationship of activities, spatial relationship of activities, such as employment, home, and leisure uses. to promote social, economic, environmental, so this is taken on the physical level, cultural well-being of past and present generations through long-term strategic integration of functions exercised under the NBEA, LGA, LTMA, and the CCRA. The SPA would provide the framework for mandatory regional spatial planning for both land and coastal marine areas. Now that one's cropped. That one's just cropped up, and it's been a little bit silent until now. Now the unitary plan and the Auckland plan are required to cover these by law as it stands. Now I will leave the coastal marine area to my physical geographer counterparts who have got more expertise than I have in this area. I'm covering more the land, the terrestrial area. But mandatory regional spatial plan. When something becomes mandatory, it becomes it be, will usually become statutory weighted. These st spatial strategies should set long-term objectives. This is 30 years, although 100 years with climatic change for urban growth and land use change, responding to climate change and identifying areas inappropriate, so inappropriate for reasons such as natural values and importance tomorrow. So basically, this is where the NBA. Um, influences the spatial plan, although that said it can influence it the other way around, given the NBA is dictating land use. So it goes both ways, because the unitary plan and Orkham plan can uh, do the same as well, go backwards and forwards. It is recommended that there is flexibility to, s to determine sequencing of timing priorities, representation of these three. This can al already happen, and Auckland's had this put under its bonnet a couple of times already. The unitary plan was the most recent case. There's a little subclause in there that caught my attention the most, and when I was raising it today in various meetings that I had, this one caught their attention the most, but they could understand how it needs to be done. Spatial strategies to cover two, two or more regions. So basically, you could do a super one on the Golden Triangle, but given that, given we were going to have half the population and 60% of all growth over the next 30 years. But the cat, the clanger was subregions on particular issues. Subregions. South Auckland is defined as a subregion. It's the biggest and fastest growing subregion in all of the country and, all, and Auckland. But your spatial strategies can drop down to subregional level. Now, has precedence been set for this? Yes, it has. In the Auckland plan, we have something called the Southern Initiative. And that's a huge big sub-focus of the Auckland plan. So at a sub-regional level to respond to the particular issue around social deprivation. One of the big wins out of the Southern Initiative as a sub-regional spatial strategy is the form of social procurement, which Auckland Council and its family follow. Social procurement means that most of the workers have to come from South Auckland and they have to be in further forms of training, whether it's apprenticeships or tertiary. So your subregions can cover stuff like that on the social matter, given socials mentioned up here anyway, or because South Auckland is the fastest growing area in all of the country, and the largest one at that in terms of population at three quarters of a million, you could do a separate subregion to cater for the growth given our infrastructure and capacity is going to, it's going to be quickly reached very fast. Furthermore, and this is where it's going to be at least every 30 years, 
and 100 years when it's with climate change. But the kicker is on this one, have I got it here? It's there on the next page. So they must look at every 30 years. There's a review clause in there, which I'll come to in a minute. Again, the Auckland Unitary Plan and Auckland Plan is already catered for this. It's nothing new for us. Should be strategic and high level, with project and site level. Now, you would have mentioned earlier, as a spatial planner, I handle national, interregional, regional, Auckland, community, uh, community Monaco City Centre, and site specific, for example, Monaco Mall being redeveloped. Should be, so spatial plans should be strategic and high level with project and site level detail provided through se separate implementation agreements and combined planning and funding processes. This is basically a structure plan or an area plan with teeth and it's also statutory weighted. So the area plans are coming back. The spatial strategy should be prepared by a joint committee and chaired by an independent chair. So this is how they get done. So this is, and there should be significant stakeholder community uh, engagement and community involvement. Fun times ahead. Spe similar to what we see under the LGA. And the special consultative procedure kicks in for Auckland when it's a the significant policy action is kicked in. So basically it affects a large group of people or the environment. The committee should seek consensus. And there's mediation powers with the minister coming in over the top if it falls aside. We had that with the unitary plan which threatened to derail. And a former finance minister gave our councillors a slight reminder that passed soon after. A regional, spa re regional spatial strategy should be consistent with the national direction under the NBEA. So but this is the one time the NBEA um become goes in reverse and becomes statutory weighted against a spatial strategy but most times it goes the other way it depends where the mps is also going to sit as well combined plans should be at, at regional and local funding plans should be consistent with the spatial so this is the um long-term plans must be consistent so go all the way back here again to what i previously drew up so this must be consistent with this, this must give weight to this, although in this case, this also must give weight to this. So you've got an interdependent relationship kicking in. So your LTPs must be consistent with the spatial plan. So it must be consistent with the Auckland plan. And here's the clanger. Here's the second one for the night. Your regional spatial strategy will be reviewed at least every nine years. So it's 10 years currently, six to 10 years with Auckland for spatial planning and 10 years with the unitary plan with flexibility re review within that period when required so if Auckland's had a huge amount of growth for whatever reason or technically we need to do it again anyway because post-COVID has upended a lot of things then it's done so under the NBEA and SPA this is how it potentially could look it could change or I could have this completely wrong your spatial plan and SPA sits at the top but it also must give effect to climate change and retreat policy as well given sea level change so they go backwards and forwards you drop down because now we know population growth job center growth uh, the spatial form the spatial pattern and the behaviors that go with it and vice versa and in interacting with each other we now know what infrastructure provisions are needed thus we know what financing is needed so financing kicks in Thus, the MBEA now kicks in, and we now start doing our unitary plans, our land use plans. But again, looking at one of the recommendations, this can come. This is, notice I haven't got any arrows pointing out, this can go back up the top. While the NBEA must give weight to the SPA, the SPA can also give weight to the MBEA. But this one, I would interpret and hope through its statutory way, and would still sit at the top, given this is the highest level we go. Urban design is factored into. Uh, the NBEAs as well, and the long-term plans kick in, which must go, must give weight more to the SPA than anything else, but it also must allow the NBEAs to be carried out effectively. And then we've got to find out where the building code's going. That's gone silent again, so we've got to follow up where that's going. But that's how the hierarchy would change. So the question is, is it time to review our spatial planning?
The answer is yes. Shall we start now? Yes. The government, and at least the Greens, have supported SPA and the NBEA going through. If we take it as a hot, if, if the, gov the minister, minister for the Environment, David Park, says this is going to go through as on the whole, maybe some minor tweaks. This is the case, we know what's going, and we can start our review planning now. We start our process review planning now. But we can start also doing uh, reviewing our spatial planning, given we're already doing so with the MPSUD. So that is my interpretation of how the report comes out, or came out, and how the strategic planning out of the SPA and the Natural and Built Environments Act come through, and how they will interact with each other, how the SPA will become statutory waiting, and all other plans must give effect to it, although in the, at the same time, it must recognize the functions of the MBEA as well, which is fair enough. You you don't want your spatial planning going half cocked, going in one direction, and then your land use planning going in the other. Otherwise, you're gonna have a, you're gonna have silos again, and that leads to out of sequence. That can lead to out of sequence planning, which can be quite damaging and exceedingly expensive, as we're finding out here down in Jury South at the moment. Of course. While I have mentioned probably the words spatial planning, spatial planner, geography, environment, social, culture, and economic more times than I can count right now, these terms are going to continue to come up a lot more in the next 18 months. And as a spatial planner and urban geographer, how this impacts our planning system, the industry, and the institutes is yet to be seen. However, if the SPA... is to carry the full critical part and statutory waiting we are believed or I believe is to occur, that is regional planning will play a, spatial planning will play a critical part in delivering the intended outcomes for the resource management system. Basically, it would allow for strategic planning at an urban growth and responding to change. Thus, it would identify areas identifiable to growth and facilitate the provision of infrastructure. Tire is going to be very interesting times for myself as a spatial planner, given spatial planning in New Zealand has not really been done. And if it is, it's not at statutory weighted level, so it's really been glossed over. Now that it is carrying such a high weighting if this goes through next year, it will be really interesting to see how the public authorities and the institutes as a whole handle this. Now I've seen this done overseas, so I'm familiar with it in that context, but how we'll handle here is yet to be seen. Exciting times ahead? You bet. Looking forward to it if it goes through? You bet. Looking forward to doing some spa work? You got it. Hopefully this will break down the silos that the RMA has given us unwittingly over the decades. And hopefully we can finally get integrated land use and transport planning done and done properly. Transport begets land use. Land use begets transport. Both beget the user environment of the city. Spatial planning does its best to address this. And the SPA Strategic Planning Act will be the best tool in doing so and achieving more equitable and environmental conscious outcomes for not only Auckland, but also for the country. This has been a audiovisual podcast on replacing the Resource Management Act, take two. Enter the nat natural environment, sorry, natural and building environments act and strategic planning act. How will they impact New Zealand and our planning system? <laughs>